Fox, Falco, Captain Falcon, Marth. These are names you probably think of first when you think of a Smash character. Or, if you really know your competitive play, you might just think of Jigglypuff. Puff's been in Smash since the very beginning, and she's been competitively relevant since the beginning too. If you're looking to get a bit more relevant in your scene, or even just pick up some GSP, or beat an arrogant friend, then head over to ProGuides.com. There you can find a ton of great educational resources to help you learn the mechanical ins and outs of Ultimate. Puff's relevance really kicks off in Melee in the Major League Gaming era back in 2004 and 5. At this time, Smash, Melee, and most esports were up and coming. The best shot anyone had at making it was through MLG and their tournaments. And one of the very first players to work directly with MLG was a Puff main named Killa OR. Killa OR even got a spot on MTV's True Life series, where you can see a ton of Melee's old greats. Killa OR was a top East Coast player and the biggest early influence on Puff. His best result was at MLG Los Angeles in 2005, where he got third place over every big Melee name except Ken and Isaiah. He also got second at a less stacked MLG Houston. And he had a truly legendary moment in the very important East-West crew battle in 2005. <laughs> In terms of the Puff meta, Killa OR's biggest developments were simple strings and good neutral. He helped popularize some early setups like up tilt rest, and helped show the importance of wave dash and movement. But his true strength was using Puff's aerials and mobility to pressure opponents, pushing them off stage where he could edge guard. In 2006, Killa OR wouldn't get the same results, and would eventually retire. Following him would be a NorCal player by the name of The King. And the king would do something vital for any character in early melee. He'd make Puff look cool. The king pushed the character's combo game to the limit. Namely, he'd find a lot more ways to land a rest. The king would get some pretty good results, but his results wouldn't be as influential as his combo videos. The king's combo videos would get a lot of players interested in Puff, including one of Smash's best competitors ever. King, and the only reason I play Puff is because of that combo video, and because king. I've seen every King video on YouTube ever. King's my favorite player. Back to your In the next few years, Mango would take the crown from King, literally and figuratively. He'd become the main player to rock the crown skin, and he'd become Melee's best player after dethroning Mewtwo King. But we're not quite there yet, because as all this is going on, Puff is having another competitive awakening. In 2006, top SSBM player Isaiah would increasingly realize that his heart wasn't in Melee, it was in 64. At this time, Isaiah would travel to Japan, where he'd play and beat just about every top Smash 64 competitor there. Courtesy of Isaiah, we have some of the earliest footage of Puff in competitive 64. This is footage of Rinko, a Japanese player that was rumored to have won an Items On televised tournament in 2000. Rinko played both Pikachu and Puff, and was presumably one of 64's better players. But at the time, no one had the handle on the game that Isaiah did. Isaiah could beat most players using most characters. Which, funnily enough, means that the other early Puff VODs came from Isaiah himself. Here he is destroying Tafikins, who will later become a top 100 melee fox main, a Smash statistician, and CLG's League GM. <laughs> Esports is something else. Anyways, like early Melee Puff, early 64 Puff wasn't yet optimized around the rest. Rinko more often used Puff's oppressive aerials and great horizontal mobility to hound his opponents into a corner, knock them off stage, and edge guard them. Rinko had a good sense of Puff's punish game and basic combos, but Isaiah had a better idea of longer touch of death chains and rest setups. Back in the US, Puff would get a notable tournament placing as well, this time from an American player named Moogle. Moogle got third at FC Diamond, which was at that point the biggest Smash tournament ever held. Moogle understood that rest combos were more practical on 64 because of the game's insane levels of pit stun, and he showcased a whole lot of drill up tilt rests, which would later become common for 64 Puff. For as underdeveloped as 64 was at the time, Puff's general strengths and weaknesses in it were still pretty clear, and her sharing some normals with Kirby meant she had good hitboxes and shield pressure. However, she died early and she had a surprisingly bad recovery. Her vertical movement was notably much worse than in Melee. In 2008, she'd actually be rated close to where she is now. In Melee, people didn't begin to understand Puff's true strength until Mango started powering up. 
She was consistently underranked, sometimes going as low as mid-tier. In 2004, Smash Backroom put Puff in second on the tier list as an April Fool's joke. The joke would be on them when Mango beat everyone in the world with Puff in 2008 and 2009. EVO World 2007 would be Mango's first big run, and it started in pools against M2K's Sheik. Mango pushed Puff's punish game to a new limit, chaining more hits together in the air and getting rests more reliably off of things like falling up air. Mango was excellent at microspacing and small feints even at this point in his career, which also helped him land whiff punish rests and bait and punish F smashes. Mango also utilized Puff's rest out of shield better than anybody at the time. These skills were enough to score Mango two huge upset wins on Mewtwo King and Ken. He still had gaps in his play, and would lose to Hugs and then Ken in the runback. But it was a third place finish at EVO, and it put Mango on the map. On the other coast, another Puff main was floating to the top. In 2007, Hungrybox would fight his way up the ranks in Florida, and become one of the best players in a star-studded region. And he did it using a style all his own. You just back air and you, you rest. But seriously, HBox played the more traditional game of using Puff's good hitboxes and mobility to take stage control in stocks. He may have been better than Mango at the time at using back air as a neutral tool in combo starter. And he was very good with Puff's grab game, regularly getting rests or edge guards off a throw. All of this set up for a very interesting 2008. It would simultaneously be the awakening of a top tier and a bottom tier. First, in January, Nintendo would release Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Brawl laid the groundwork for another side of competitive Smash, a side where Puff would be nowhere near as good. In both Melee and 64, Puff benefits off the weakness of others, just like the dangerous apex predator that she is. In particular, she destroys the weak recoveries and landing states of many characters in 64 and Melee. In Brawl, and all following Smash titles, recoveries would never be as weak across the board as they were before. Nor would hit stun be so heavy, meaning rest would never be as practical and punishing as in Melee in 64. The problem is, Puff needs these strengths to survive in the wild. She doesn't have the disjoints of the sorties, nor does she have the damage and speed of a spacey. And she's so light and floaty that she doesn't do well taking trades with her opponent. There's a lot more to say about Brawl Puff specifics, like the lack of combos or chain grabs and the nerfs to her hitboxes, but it's more important to note that the design changes in Brawl would carry forward and carry Puff out of high and top tier in Smash 4 and Ultimate. While Puff was struggling in Brawl, she was entering a golden age in Melee. In 2008, Mango would establish himself as the best player in the world, and HBox would become one of the five gods. Both would do so at Revival of Melee, a national tournament run by Bobby Scar. Here, Hungrybox would upset Korean DJ and become a new player to watch, while Mango would get first place over M2K, Chudat, and many more. Mango kept honing Puff's intense punish game and only got better at using her aerial mobility to force mistakes and get big openings. Revival of Melee was only the beginning. After mounting a massive loser's run at Pound 3 in February of 2008, Mango would start winning a lot more. And so would Hungrybox. HBox leveled up a lot across 2008, developing a devastating punish game and finely tuned spacing. The two would regularly meet in Top 8, too. Mango came in first, but HBox was rarely far behind. It was one of the few eras in Melee where you could see high-level Puff dittos even semi-regularly. By 2009, Puff had totally evolved from a weird floaty mid-tier to an OP character that challenged the idea of what Melee was. But reputation often comes with success. This is where the Puff hate would begin. Everybody watching, I friggin' hate Jigglypuff. I think she's the worst character. Why can she press down B and kill you? Doesn't make any sense. At Mango and Hungrybox's level, Puff didn't seem to play by the same rules. Her recovery was very hard to touch, her neutral was very air-based, and her punish game was less about long combos and tech chases, and more about stage control and short but insanely potent strings. Mango's Puff did eventually gain popularity. His pressure cooker style more resembled traditional melee than HBox's careful aerial spacing. However, Mango's Puff was still Puff. 
he'd still default to back airing to control space, and he still had a totally skewed risk reward off stage. And he still didn't get comboed or combo others as hard as the Spaceys did. In 2010, Mango would switch to maining Fox and Falco. In the brief vacuum left by Mango, Hungrybox climbed to first for a few months, winning Apex 2010 over Armada and tipped off six over PPMD. At around that point, Puff climbed to the literal top tier, a spot she shared with the space animals. Hbox dominated the Falco and Peach matchups and did well against Fox too. Mango had also just beaten Mewtwo King's Marth and made Puff look very hard to beat. In 2011, Armada would come back with a young Link to counter Puff, and PPMD would adapt with Falco. The era of the Five Gods went into full effect, with Armada and Mango becoming the leading two deities. As one of the Five Gods, Hbox consistently got great results, but he struggled to top the Pantheon and win S-tier events. By the time Melee It On Me established a top 100 rank in 2013, Hungrybox was usually the lowest or second lowest ranked god. Puff's golden age had ended and the character fell to high tier. In the meanwhile, Brawl Puff was in complete competitive freefall. Hbox was the main representative for Puff in the early days of Brawl, and did respectably in region, but struggled out of it and would co-main Deedity later on. The Puffster and C7A would find more success with the character, but still not much. The Puffster had some notable successes over players like Pelka in the earlier days, when cheesier stages were allowed but even he'd use Diddy Kong as a co-main. As Brawl's metagame and stage list developed, it became clear that low tiers lacked the tools to compete at a high level. Puff only became more irrelevant as Brawl aged. In 64, Puff had a bit of a dark age as well. After her early moments in 2006 and 2007, Puff didn't have much success up until 2011 and would drop down the tier list a few slots. In 2011, Takuro turned things around by getting second with Puff in Japan's annual Kanto Major. He beat 64 legends like Prince and Sekirei along the way. This would just be the beginning. In 2014, Puff would have a renaissance. For starters, Takuro would get fifth at Kanto 2014. But more importantly, Isaiah would decide that it was about time he won North America's biggest 64 tournament using Puff. You know, just do that. Isaiah would run through an insanely stacked Apex 2014 bracket using only Puff and he wouldn't drop a set. He'd once again optimized the character's rest setups, finding ways to tack on damage so the rest would guarantee a kill on Hyrule Castle, where the blast zones were so far away that he could wake up and do it again. This performance, in part with the rise of Japanese Puffs, brought Nintendo's least successful lounge singer back up the tier list. 2015 and 2016 would be much better years for Puff in both Melee and 64, but not on the other side of the Smash fence. Smash 4 came and replaced Brawl, but Puff was every bit as bad as before, just now in different ways. Her floatiness was terrible for a game with so many vertical kills, her lightweight was awful with rage, her rest confirms felt inconsistent, her combo game was just as underwhelming, and her edge guarding was just as irrelevant. She was a popular pick for the absolute worst in Smash 4. In Smash 64, Puff's success simply kept going. 2015 would be the birth of Puff's best 64 solo main, Wangera. In 2015, he'd get third at Kansai and start traveling. In 2016, he'd get third at Genesis by beating Karo Karapi and Isaiah, twice. Where Isaiah optimized what Puff got off of a grab, Wangera optimized how to get the grab, and further improved the character's edge guarding using Down Smash. Wangera would rank fifth in 2016, and Puff would see a lot more representation in the top 100, both as a secondary and main. In the melee world, 2015 marked the beginning of Hungrybox's float to the top. That was the year he would start consistently beating his demons, Mango and Armada. He'd still struggle to win a tournament with both in attendance, but he'd play second at so many majors that he'd jump up to number two on the rankings. Towards the end of 2015, Puff finally saw success akin to her earlier golden age. At Dreamhack Winter, Hbox would place first over both Armada and Mango. And at the MLG World Finals, for the first time in a long time, there were two Puffs in the top eight of a stacked tournament, Hbox at first and Prince Abu at seventh. This is notable because while there were other great Puff mains before, they often came and went from the top 100. 
Prince Abu is still a consistent, strong Puff main in Melee today. In 2016, Puff stock as a whole would go on the rise. The biggest moment, of course, being when HBOX won EVO 2016 with a bracket reset over Armada that showed why Melee Puff is so good, so beloved, and so hated. From EVO 2016 and on, HBOX and a gradually growing base of Puff mains entered into an arms race with other characters. For Puff, it was all about being eagle-eyed in both catching and forcing slip-ups. Mistakes as small as a missed tech or bad DI on one throw could cost a stock. For most characters, it was about really nailing the kill confirms and tacking on as many stray hits as possible. Puff wasn't easily comboed, but every hit mattered since she died so early. Increasingly, Puff would win this arm race. If you want to win that arms race against any of the insane characters in Ultimate, like, say, the literal arms one, then you should go to ProGuides.com. We have live coaching, character guides, and more. From 2017 and on, HBOX would rank number one, finally dethroning Armada. More notable Puff mains would appear too, most notably Two Saint and Michael. Interestingly, the two would have vastly different styles, calling back to the Mango HBOX divide, or even the King and Killa OR. 2017 and on, Puff would fare better in the world of the newer Smash titles too. In late 2017 and early 2018, an enterprising, nationally ranked Pikachu main named Captain L discovered the Puff had some key strengths. Namely, she could absolutely camp the hell out of the ledge. Captain L played Puff in a way that could only be described as merciless. He created a very reliable mix-up using ledge camping. Basically, he could threaten the ledge with a sing, aerial, or pound. If the opponent stood near, he caught them with Sing. If they came down, he up-aired or used Pound. If they tried to hit him from the stage, he could air dodge, then rest them. It was surprisingly good. Good enough that Captain L beat Larry Lur with the strategy. Funnily enough, at about the same time, a Japanese Puff main named Arika also started doing well, but using a pretty honest style. He got an impressive 17th at Umabura Smash 4 final, mostly by finding good horizontal combos with Puff. 2018 raised the question of if Puff could have done better given more time in Smash 4, or if her lead shenanigans were just a gimmick waiting to be figured out. In the Melee world, 2018 was more Puff greatness. HBOX made it so being a top 20 Melee player meant you needed to consider the Puff matchup as deeply as Fox or Marth, despite the Puff player base being much smaller. Zane, Wizrobe, Plup, Mango, and Leffen would all take notable wins off of HBOX in 2018 and 2019, but no one would quite take the crown. Uh, um, bandana. The past two years have been a Puff-centric call and response cycle. First, one of Melee's top 10 players finds an innovation in their matchup with Puff and beats HBOX. Then, HBOX rallies with his own adjustments a few months down the line and evens it out. The closest the cycle has truly come to being broken is with Zane in 2020. The result is that Puff is oddly central to Melee's meta, despite not being that popular even now. Her Melee iteration is one of Smash's most curious characters because of how it breaks the mold more common to the game. Normally, the meta-dominant characters are the ones who fit so well into the engine that they almost embody it. Bayonetta being the queen of the vertical combo and lower percent KO, Meta Knight being the king of neutral and Ices being the consoles of chain grabbing, 64 Pikachu being the apex of zero to deaths. Melee Puff's an interesting exception. She does carry the game's high-risk, high-reward style, but she also pushes both players to look harder for an opening and play more cautiously, because every opening matters more and it's harder for either party to bait the other out. And then there's Ultimate Puff. Ultimate Puff is truthfully hard to fit inside the narrative of the character because, well, the little pink ball doesn't have any kind of story inside Ultimate yet. She's new and different in some ways, but overall has the same issues that hounded her since Brawl. She simply doesn't have that insane melee mobility and kill power that redeems her inherent flaws. Puff was overall better on Ultimate's release than Smash 4's, but that's not saying much. In Ultimate, Puff was faster, got rewarded more for landing rest, had more combos, a legitimate shield breaker, and could edgeguard some cast member as well. Unfortunately, she just still didn't have the offensive tools to kill opponents before they killed her. 
she doesn't have the keep away tools to stop top rushdown characters, or the engage tools to break down top zoners, and she loses to the many, many sorties and their disjoints. Across 2019, Nintendo would buff the puff, giving her more reliable rest setups and better offensive tools. Most notably, Patch 6.0 gave her pound more shield and hit stun, and her dare better auto cancelling and less lag. Initially, these changes got a lot of hype for leading into rest, but now it seems that neither are that reliable as rest confirms. And the biggest buff may actually be to her forward throw angle of all things. These buffs have made Puff into a nice niche pick, rather than just an underwhelming low tier or a ledge cheeser. Ultimate has nerfed enough recoveries that Puff does have the ability to surprise and overwhelm unsuspecting opponents. As shown by Hbox's win over Arfang or Base Mage's tight Game 5 set against Stroder. However, Ultimate's three main puffs in Base Mage, Arika, and Hungry Box haven't quite managed a big national tournament run yet. Arika has gotten the closest with a 25th at Umabura SP4, but truthfully, Piranha Plant did better at the very same tournament. Ultimate's puff hits closer to making the character functional and well rounded but she still just doesn't have the offensive oomph to make up for how easily she dies or how much she struggles in neutral. She needs some serious buffs to get there too, not piecemeal stuff. If you look at 64 puff, you've got a healthy mid to high tier who can actually win majors. And if you look at melee, she's integral to the game's meta. Looking at the way both games are designed, it feels like Puff will always fit better in 64 and Melee than in new titles. In the old Smash world, recoveries are so much worse, rest kills so much earlier, and her hitboxes are so much better in comparison to the cast. So if we're being honest, even buffs might not be enough for the Puff. This character may have been fundamentally left behind by the direction Nintendo took in the newer titles. What do you think? Could Puff ever fit into the new world of Smash? Could buffs be enough? Would she need a redesign in a new game? Let us know in the comments below. After that, make sure you pound that subscribe button and check out ProGuides.com to learn even more about Smash.